So in this lecture, we'll be visiting both autosomal recessive inheritance and then autosomal dominant inheritance. First, we'll cover the recessive inheritance. Now, autosomal recessive diseases occur in individuals who have two mutant alleles. You're probably familiar with that. Usually, autosomal recessive diseases are loss of function diseases. And on occasion or regularly in the uh, heterozygote, there's some compensation. They may have half the gene product, but in the case of uh, sickle cell, for example, you will have compensation. So the individual is carrying the sickle cell allele, half of their hemoglobin will be of the sickle cell variety, and half of it will be of the regular variety, and this is enough to get by. So that's what we mean by compensation. Having two uh, recessive alleles in that case is fatal, but it's not always fatal. It's uh, just the recessive condition uh, expressing the actual phenotype. So in these types of matings, we end up having unaffected individuals, carrier individuals, you can see both the son and daughter in the middle, and affected individuals. Usually one-fourth will be affected in a mating between two heterozygotes. So let's take a look at the three possible matings. First of all, you could have both heterozygous parents, as we just saw in the last graphic. Um, and here in the Punnett square, we can see that we result in, indeed, one-fourth affected individuals. Now, we don't have enough offspring, like uh, Mendel did with peas, to really consider that one-fourth of the offspring would have this. So, uh, you know, if we're dealing with a thousand pea plants, that's one thing, but as uh, individuals, you know, maybe, or parents, maybe we're lucky to have four. So you may see that one in four is affected. So we call it a one-fourth probability that you would have an affected child. Um, and we can work with probabilities because there's also a one-fourth possibility of a son or... Anyway, we'll move further into that as we look at sex linkage. Um, the next scenario that we can look at is having a heterozygous parent and a homozygous parent, in which case one-fourth of them would be, I mean one-half of them would be affected and the homozygous recessive state. And the final way that we could have affected offspring, of course, is between two homozygous recessive individuals, in which case the probability of them having a homozygous recessive child is 100 percent. They're pretty much guaranteed. Um, so three different ways. Autosomal uh, recessive pedigrees have a characteristic appearance. So when you look at, uh, take, you've taken a pedigree and you're observing the pedigree, you can predict what sort of inheritance pattern it is and then perhaps do further testing to discern precisely what that inheritance pattern is or what the genotype behind it is. So in general, what you see is both, in this case, both parents are carriers and we can predict that both parents are, or we can predict that it's a recessive uh, inheritance pattern because we see that about one in four offspring is affected. They've shown six here, but the purpose is to also show that males and females are affected equally. So again, it's a probability. You could see more or you could see none. The probability uh, could be about one in four affected. And then uh, let's look at an example. So cystic fibrosis is probably a condition that you are uh, pretty familiar with, or cystic fibrosis results from uh, having a mutant transport protein that you may not be so familiar with. So this chloride transport protein is, when it's functioning, it acts to transport chloride outside of the cell membrane. And let's say we're looking at the respiratory package and uh, passage, sorry, uh, chloride is transported outside of the cell membranes and into the respiratory passage. And that chloride acts to draw fluid out of the cells and keep the surface fairly well lubricated. Now, in the case that we have a broken 
transport protein or it doesn't make its way into the membrane. The protein's made, but it doesn't lock into the membrane properly and doesn't transport chloride ions, then we have an osmotic battle in which chloride's not out there, so it's hypotonic or hyper hypotonic out there and we end up having uh, much more mucus uh, and thicker mucus and thus the effects that we see with um, cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis transport protein CFTR and one in 2,000 children approximately is affected by the cystic fibrosis transporter protein issue um, which is fairly frequent but actually not too frequent considering that one in 23 people are silent carriers. So they're carriers of it because it's an autosomal recessive condition. They don't express the condition. And if you think about it, one in 23 people seems like kind of a lot. But this one in 2000 statistic is based on, okay, if you have one in 23 people, what is the chance that that person will mate with one in 23 of the other sex and produce an offspring? And that statistic comes out to be approximately one in 2,000 incidences. So when you're calculating these sorts of outcomes, you want to consider both the probability of having the allele and the probability of running into someone else in the population with that allele and reproducing with them. So that's sort of the mission of using pedigree analysis for uh, the field of genetic counseling. So on occasion, we'll see that autosomal disorders are sex influenced. So just as we could have penetrance and expressivity issues, there are more things to cloud our vision on what's really going on. And I bring this up because uh, hereditary hematochromosis, chromatosis is uh, one of those disorders that is expressed almost exclusively in males and very rarely do we see this in females, like five to 10 times more likely in a male. And I also bring this up because it is, is probably the most common hereditary disorder, even though it's only expressed in or mostly expressed in males. And we're not entirely sure why, uh, but what uh, this disorder is, is a, a decreased absorption or enhanced absorption of iron so that there's way too much iron in the system. And that causes an iron overload, which causes coloring of certain organs. They get very pigmented with the um, iron pigment, and that causes serious damage uh, in some organs. Some organs are just pigmented. Other organs, like the heart, liver, and pancreas, uh, get serious damage from it. And of course, if we know that someone has this disorder, then we can treat for it and keep the iron levels low in the diet and not have the organs affected. Here's a quick flash of organs that are affected uh, by the chromatosis, uh, the coloring. Um, but again, only the heart, liver, and pancreas have a really serious condition with it. Hereditary hematochromatosis, uh, one of the most common autosomal recessive disorders or hereditary disorders um, of the autosomes. So keep that one in mind for your exams for sure. So I thought I'd put together a slide that uh, covers some of the main autosomal recessive disorders that you'll be responsible for knowing. You don't necessarily need to know all of the details about them, but you do need to be able to recognize them as autosomal recessive. First of all, sickle cell anemia. I think we've covered that plenty, and you probably understand mostly about that. And we just covered cystic fibrosis as a great example of a, an autosomal recessive disorder where we're thickening the mucus because of a broken chloride transporter. And albinism, that one's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, all pigmented areas end up white um, or unpigmented. And then phenylketonuria, you've probably heard of, uh, but children, when they're born, get a foot prick to take a blood sample. The testing for this has been around uh, for a long, long time, uh, probably since the 40s. Um, and what this is, is a uh, causes a buildup of uh, 
of uh, phenylalanine, uh, and it causes that to be in the urine, but phenylalanine turns out to be really toxic in high doses. So phenylalanine doesn't get converted to tyrosine. And so uh, if we have a big buildup of that, it's a problem. But one of these conditions, if you test for it, very easy to treat, uh, you can um, remove the phenylalanine, which is found in things like Diet Coke and uh, most proteins, <laughs> unfortunately, but that will end up uh, not causing the mental retardation that would come about if there was a buildup of phenylketone or phenylalanine. Uh, Tay-Sachs disease uh, is uh, a hexoaminidase A deficiency, which means that uh, the lysosomal storage of basically uh, the trash lysosomes that are inside the cells end up getting packed with trash and not broken down. So hexoaminidase A is what would break things down in order for them to be disposed of. So Tay-Sachs disease is a really sad, very, uh, um, and it ends up being a fatal uh, disorder and it's not treatable at this time. Hemochromatosis we've already covered. And then there are a number of different glycogen storage deficiencies um, that also are autosomal recessive disorders. So Tay-Sachs disease falls under lysosomal storage diseases. There are other lysosomal storage diseases. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know them all by name, but uh, again, you should know them as homozygous um, recessive disorders or autosomal recessive disorders. So keep these ones in mind because they are important to know. Now, you're going to run into a vast number of different disorders. Um, so this is a hint that I've always sort of gone by, is that almost all diseases that make an appearance during childhood uh, will be autosomal recessive disorders. And the way that I will think of that is it's easier to remember this short, fairly short list of autosomal recessive disorders than it is to remember all of the other disorders. So if you can keep those ones in mind, um, you'll be in great shape because then you can get a question that perhaps says, oh, what is this? And you don't have it on your list of autosomal recessive. You can um, guess it as an autosomal dominant disorder um, or perhaps even... Uh, more of a um, X-linked type of disorder. Anyway, so a little hint for you there.